Okay, then uh, uh, let's uh, get started. First speaker today is uh, Sandeep Trivedi from uh, Tata Institute, Mumbai, and uh, he will tell us about the target space entanglement and uh, space time geometry. Please start. Okay, thank you so much, Masanori, and I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak in this exciting workshop. And I also uh, want to thank you all for joining, some of you at uh, very early hours of the day for you, and especially thank my uh, some of my collaborators who are also here uh, at early hours for them uh, to be here to take part in the discussion and feel the really difficult questions. Uh, so my title is Target Space Entanglement and Space-Time Geometry. Um, and it's based on two papers I've written with Shumit Das, the first one, one of them, the most recent with Shumit Das, uh, Sinong Liu, Anurag Kashyap, Gautam Mandal, uh, and the earlier one with Shumit and Anurag and Gautam. And this is what I'll be talking to you about. I'll begin with an introduction and then uh, tell you uh, what I mean by target space entanglement give you a definition and so on then uh, propose that in fact uh, this notion of target space entanglement uh, is related and the same as bulk entanglement and define the bulk entanglement in a precise way which we believe uh, is equal to uh, target space entanglement that's a proposal from our side um, and then end with conclusions and some discussion. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, because uh, you know I'm only talking to a blank screen here and I can't see your faces. Uh, so please do interrupt and we don't have to wait till the discussion at all uh, to take your comments and questions as we go along. So a key question in the study of quantum gravity is how does a smooth space-time arise? And if we have an underlying description, then we would like to know how does a smooth space-time emerge from the underlying degrees of freedom. Within the ADS-CFT correspondence, there is a concrete way to at least try and pose this question. The uh, conformal field theory uh, can be thought of as providing the underlying description, and we would like to understand how a smooth anti de Sitter space uh, geometry arises or emerges from it. Of course, perhaps in the long run, uh, in string theory, this correspondence should be thought of as a duality without one side being uh, more fundamental than the other, but for now we can treat the conformal field theory side as being the underlying degrees of freedom. Okay, so here's a picture, you might have seen it. The uh, conformal field theory lives on the boundary in one lower dimension, and then you have ADS space. Um, and this can be a very smooth geometry. And we want to understand how this smooth geometry arises from a underlying description, which is in fact a field theory without gravity in one lower dimension. <clears throat> Now the, uh, and we know uh, already quite a lot is known about the correspondence. So we know that the ADS space is smooth when one is uh, in the large end limit in the field theory. And if there is a coupling constant, when that coupling constant like the Tooft coupling is also big. It's in this limit when the field theory gets strongly coupled that we get a smooth uh, geometry. The correspondence can be extended uh, beyond ADS CFT to geometries which are not anti de Sitter space by considering near horizon geometries of uh, DP brains, where P can be uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. For three brains, as I'm sure many of you know, you get anti de Sitter space. This is a famous example. But in other cases, also, we believe there is a similar correspondence where you retain the near horizon geometry of these DP brains and you keep the corresponding field theory you get from the DP brains by going to low energies. This field theory is no longer a conformal field theory. The bulk is not anti de Sitter space, but again, we believe that there is such a correspondence between the field theory and the bulk and in an appropriate limit where the field theory becomes strongly coupled, the bulk geometry is smooth. 
Now, in particular, we will. Do we have to have? Uh, go ahead, please. Do we have to have like? Yeah, do we have to have supersymmetries, like a large amount of supersymmetry, even in the case of uh, non-CFTs and non-ADS? Well, I mean, I would say the supersymmetric case is best understood, but starting from that, you can do deformations. For example, you could excite the theory at finite temperature or correspondingly choose boundary conditions along spatial directions which break supersymmetry. I think those are the best understood cases. Um, you can also have genuine uh, non-supersymmetric uh, compactifications in string theory which have smooth ADS, but the story is, as far as I know, typically more complicated there and whether they are stable or there are unstable decay directions, uh, even non-perturbative instabilities can be quite tricky in anti-dissitor space, so I would say they are perhaps not as well understood. But to some extent, certainly this can be extended um, and is also understood in the non-supersymmetric context. That's what I would say. Um, but the supersymmetric ones are, are perhaps the best understood and already there, understanding how smooth space times emerge is quite a beautiful and non-trivial question. Okay, is that okay? Uh, we can talk more about oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this case later. Okay, so in particular, we'll be interested in uh, the case of zero brains. In this case, the boundary is just quantum mechanics. It only exists in time, uh, no spatial direction. And conceptually, you know, it's a very simple context in that you have a, a quantum mechanics. It's not a very simple kind of quantum mechanics, but still after all, it's just quantum mechanics. And in a suitable limit where it gets strongly coupled, it's supposed to give rise to a smooth space-time geometry. And uh, the simplicity conceptually makes this very attractive. Another reason for this is there's been very, and this is one of the main reasons I'm so excited to be talking here today, is that the zero brain case has been the context of very impressive numerical progress by various people. I've written down some names here, perhaps I've missed some, and including the chair of our session, Masanori, and some others, as Toby Wiseman is here, and some of you are, all, I hope, are also here. So this new, impressive numerical progress is actually one of the main reasons why um, we have also focused on the zero brain case uh, to try and, and understand that better. Our results will be more general. They will also apply to DP brains where you have a boundary theory, which is a field theory extending in various spatial directions as well. But mostly for concreteness and conceptual clarity in the talk, I'll focus on the zero brain case today. Okay, now some of um, my motivation I already mentioned, but um, let me dwell on it a little more. So uh, one somewhat more concrete motivation is to try and understand the connection between entanglement and smooth space-time geometry better. Um, and as I was saying, uh, the fact that numerical techniques and ideas are coming together with theoretical ones uh, makes this a, an exciting time to try and understand this connection better. The general context is that there is increasing evidence, and I should say some hype, that entanglement is in fact crucially tied to the emergence of smooth space times. Um, that somehow uh, this is a kind of slogan uh, the fabric of space-time itself can be really thought of as being given by entanglement, the intrinsically quantum features of the wave function. Now, this is a very intriguing idea and uh, certainly worth understanding in more detail. Um, and that's one of the concrete uh, motivations. Here's a picture just for you that this entire fabric may be to good extent given by entanglement. Just very briefly, before we go ahead, what exactly is entanglement? We'll make it precise and the precise concept, we will use target space entanglement, I'll make totally precise. But roughly, as you all know, quantum systems have correlations which cannot, some of which cannot be mimicked by classical systems. Entanglement refers to those aspects of these correlations which simply cannot arise in a classical theory, even after we allow for an arbitrarily large number of extra hidden local variables. 
Okay, this is, was Bell's great insight in the 60s. And those aspects roughly of a quantum system, which cannot be mimicked by classical ones, are what we call entanglement. Now, to be more precise, if you have a quantum system with two parts and a Hilbert space, which has a tensor product decomposition, so that the full Hilbert space is HA tensor product HB, and let's say you start with a pure state in the full Hilbert space with a density matrix given like this. Construct the density matrix for the first Hilbert space by tracing out the degrees over the second. Then the von Neumann entropy of this density matrix, trace rho log rho with the trace being taken over the remaining Hilbert space A is what is called the entanglement entropy. Okay, so this is the concrete form. We will adapt it to our context. There are some subtleties I should mention for gauge theories, etc. Some of them will be in play because the quantum mechanics we are dealing with for zero brains is a gauge theory, but they won't be too essential and I won't go into too many details here. So roughly this is the idea of what we mean by entanglement and we'll make it more precise. Now, another motivation is in fact to understand from the bulk point of view, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula better and its connection to entanglement. As you all know, Bekenstein and Hawking have this beautiful formula for the entropy of a black hole, that it is the entropy is the area in units of Newton's constant with this famous coefficient one fourths. Now, if instead of, and here this area is the area of the event horizon of the black hole. Now, instead of a black hole, let's just take, you know, some region in the bulk where you have gravity and some quantum field, say a scalar field. So let's say this is the x-axis and I divide it in two parts. I look at, say, one region, say x greater than zero or some region, which I've shown in red, and I'm interested in how entangled is this bulk scalar field or bulk field with the rest of the region shown in bulk. You can do this calculation if gravity is weakly coupled, etc. It's very easy to do. You neglect gravity, just do some free scalar field or even an interacting scalar field or a quantum field in general. The answer you get is that it goes like the transverse area. The area transfers to the x direction in this case in units of an ultraviolet cutoff. Now in, in three plus one dimensions, the dimensions work out so it's the cutoff square. This is a length cutoff. And the tempting thought is that the underlying cutoff in a theory with gravity is provided by the Planck scale. And perhaps the complete version of this formula when you include all UV effects is that it becomes the transverse area over four times G Newton. Analogous to the Bekenstein Hawking formula, but this time applying to any uh, transverse region uh, which divides uh, space into two parts. Okay, this is a, a, a question, it's a conjecture, but it's a kind of tantalizing uh, conjecture or, or, or question, and it would be indeed beautiful if the UV completion of what we see when we do low energy calculations, in fact, is that the cutoff is replaced by four times G Newton. So is this true? Uh, this is a question and we'd like to understand it better and that too is one of the motivations for my talk. Now just to say that um, in fact others before us like Jacobson, Bianchi and Myers have proposed that the correct version of this formula is indeed the one I proposed, the area over 4G Newton. There's also some evidence if you look at how both sides get renormalized. As you integrate out UV degrees of freedom, you will change the UV cutoff. You'll also change um, the Newton's constant. And in fact, it turns out that the renormalization of the entanglement entropy because of changing the UV cutoff and of Newton's constant is the same. So the proposal that the entanglement entropy is given by this formula is invariant under renormalization group flow. So this is sort of suggests that if the formula might well be true, but many questions remain. One of the key questions is, what do you even mean in a precise way by the transverse area? What do I mean by cutting up some spatial region into two parts in a theory of quantum gravity? Because the notion of space, time, locality itself is not precise. So the notion that I'm breaking up some region into two parts is not a 
precisely stated notion. So what does this formula even mean and, and is it correct? So these are the kinds of questions and trying to make them more precise also was, is one of the motivations. Now a third motivation is to extend some of the beautiful work which was done in the past in one plus one dimensional string theory. This is really a very concrete context of, I would say, holography. Again, the boundary theory here, the bulk theory is two dimensional. The boundary theory is one dimensional. Again, quantum mechanics. And in fact, in, in beautiful work, Schumit, who is one of our collaborators in here, had shown already in 1995 that the bulk entanglement in this case is indeed finite. Uh, this is like uh, my saying that it would be area over G Newton for G Newton, therefore finite. And in this case, he showed that it's indeed finite. And the finiteness arises because the boundary theory um, has a parameter n, which is large, but finite. And so the finiteness of n provides a cutoff. And uh, that suggests that perhaps this hope we were making, we were stating of of the, uh, the entanglement entropy being finite in the theory of gravity is true more generally. And we would like to understand if it's true, uh, what makes it finite? Are there, is it again the finiteness of, of n, a, a large parameter occurring in some underlying boundary description, which is responsible for its finiteness? So, so this was another motivation. Um, and we want to see whether it works in more general settings. Okay, now just to give you some of the key punchlines so then you can go to sleep, uh, especially if it's early for you. Uh, in this talk, what we'll do is give a precise definition of entanglement entropy in the boundary theory in quantum mechanics. And this precise definition is what we'll call target space entanglement. What we'll then do is propose that this target space entanglement in fact is related to bulk entanglement the kind of entanglement I uh, mentioned to you in the bulk when we divide some bulk spatial region into two parts. So it's, it's related. In fact, it's the same we will propose as bulk entanglement. And therefore, this target space entanglement then, as part of this proposal, is the transverse area over four times G Newton. Okay, so this is a proposal, the second part that the target space entanglement, which we'll define precisely, will in fact be obtained also in the bulk by computing the transverse area in terms of Newton's constant. This is a bulk calculation. The uh, entanglement entropy, as we'll define it, will be a concept defined in the boundary theory, and we'll propose that they are in fact the same. So you know, that, I have a question. Uh, please I have a ahead. question. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, there, when we're, uh, in the entangled entropy, you said that, uh, you know, the contribution that is there, you know, is the, another scale that is coming up is the ultraviolet uh, scale. Right. And, you know, also you talk about a transfer area. And then after you're talking about ultraviolet scale, is it that all the degrees of relevant degrees of freedom that are there are basically close to the boundary itself? Yeah, because, that's, uh, that's right. That's a very good question. So the reason why this happens is that, in fact, the entanglement is dominated by extremely short distance modes cutting across the horizon. Now, let me see if I can be so bold as to. That is, you know, modes which do this, connecting the two ends and of very short distance. That actually dominates the entanglement. That's why it ends up going like the ultraviolet cutoff. And that's why we know that the answer is going to be sensitive to whatever is the final UV cutoff in the theory. Okay, so that's right. But that's what happens. The, the calculations in a quantum field theory already tell you that it's the UV which is contributing in the main to this, calc to this quantity. Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, so, um, so this is what we'll do. We'll give a precise definition and then propose that it is equal to something in the bulk, this beautiful formula of Bekenstein and Hawking now applied to a general transverse area. And uh, I think I just said this already, but the definition is precise. The proposal is a proposal which indeed needs to be explored more, might well need to be fine tuned per further. I'll dwell on some of this as we go along. And in fact, attempting to uh, understand target space entanglement numerically and explore the connection with the bulk, I think will be very important in trying to go forwards with establishing this bulk connection 
with uh, the Bekenstein Hawking formula further. Okay, now just a few words about zero brains because they will be the concrete setting. Uh, here is, a, is the metric uh, for zero brains. Uh, this is in 10 dimensions because we are dealing with the space time in string theory. Uh, just, just, on... just to make sure, so, so you use yeah. so the zero brain case as a concrete example, but the target space entanglement itself can be defined the other theories as well. That's right. Any DP brain theory. That's right. Okay, That's okay. Exactly correct. And you'll see some of that. Otherwise, we can discuss it more in the in the discussion session. Mm -hmm. But that's true, Masanori. That it's it's a more general concept. That's right. Mm. Okay. So so this is the zero brain background. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I thought maybe. Okay. Just a small question. Um, since you said that uh, you know the entanglement entropy that is there, the contributions that are there are coming close to. The boundary, right? Yeah. But generally, the Einstein, the, Becken, uh, the Bekenstein formula that is there is telling you the total number of uh, uh, states in a way, you know, which is there inside the entire bulk of the surface. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of finding it to be really, uh, uh, you know, kind of really shaky that, you know, a formula which is supposed to tell you about the information that is there throughout the bulk in this calculation is basically just coming up because of some uh, quantum effects just close to the boundary isn't is it like a call uh, i'm just curious whether this thing is just a calculation artifact and not something really uh, uh, you know uh, something actually measuring the total number of states inside that closed area in right. case I'm clear well you know what uh, well you could say morally that what we learn from beckenstein and hawking and what holography makes precise is that you can think of the degrees of freedom of the black hole living on its horizon, you know, one, one qubit per Planck area. And uh, in holography, which is the near horizon region, that becomes precise because the hologram lives indeed in one dimension less. And in a sense, what we are saying is that may be a general story for general transverse areas. Uh, that, um, you know, bulk locality anyway is an approximate concept and the true number of degrees of freedom, uh, you know, uh, live on the boundary and it's the entanglement of these true degrees of freedom, which also gets reflected then in the resulting area of the boundary. As you change the entanglement, the area would also change. As I said, this is a proposal but it is motivated by the basic idea of holography that in a theory of gravity, bulk locality is approximate and the true degrees of freedom might well be captured by a boundary. So um, that, that's the sort of underlying thinking. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Sandeep, Sandeep can, can I ask a question? Please, please, yes. Uh, is there any relationship to Liu Takayani formula? Yeah, yeah, that's a very important question and I'm just coming there. And, uh, you know, you'll see that the idea of target space entanglement will develop is different from the Ryu Takayanagi formula. Both talk about entanglement, but they are somewhat different concepts of entanglement. I see. And, uh, and, but that's an important question. And let me, I think I'll come to it almost next. And then please see, maybe we can have a little more discussion about that. Uh, in yes. A Okay. Thank you. Um, Sandeep, can I make a comment? Oh, please, about... Gautam, please. <laughs> yeah, so this is in um, answer to the previous question about the transverse area. Hmm. And why this? So yeah. this is actually um, uh, a standard feature of stat statistical mechanics calculations also in which you have uh, static models with nearest neighbor coupling. And uh, like, you know, in the famous works of uh, Calabrese and Cardi, and also in higher dimensional calculations that it is indeed the transverse area there also. And it has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, one is dealing with nearest neighbor couplings of the static models. And this is about vacuum entanglement. Of course, when you talk about uh, thermal, um, uh, you know, uh, entanglement, then there is a volume term, but uh, the vacuum entanglement uh, has uh, indeed the transverse area also in static models. Uh, I, I thought I would just make that comment. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, okay. So to go ahead, um, so just a brief uh, run through and then we'll, we'll get going. So this is the kind of geometry. There's a radial direction. There's symmetry. 
uh, spherical symmetry, so SO9 symmetry with nine spatial directions. Um, and basically this radius becomes big as uh, the turf coupling G string times N becomes being big. Uh, and generally, more generally speaking, the supergravity solution is under control when N, uh, this parameter N, which is really the number of zero brains which have come together to generate the geometry, when that is very much bigger than one, and also in some region in radial space, okay? It can't be too big, otherwise the uh, alpha prime corrections will become big. It can't be too small, otherwise at least type 2a supergravity will break down because the string coupling will become big. So in some region you have a kind of bubble, and in that bubble you have a smooth geometry well under control in type 2a supergravity. And so you have a smooth geometry emerging here, and we want to understand it. And we want to understand it from the boundary point of view. The boundary, as I said, is just quantum mechanics. And the quantum mechanics is, uh, you know, how complicated can it be? Well, it is somewhat complicated because you have n by n matrices, nine of them corresponding to the nine spatial directions we saw. So there are order n square degrees of freedom in, in these matrices, uh, each of which is n by n. There's a gauge field, and because of that, the derivatives are covariant derivatives here. There are also fermions, which I won't be very explicit about, but which are actually quite important for the supersymmetry, etc. The fermions are also in the adjoint representation of the UN gauge group, like the matrices, like the X1 to X9 matrices. Okay. And as I was alluding, there is a gauge symmetry here under which Xi goes to uh, the unitary matrix Xi U inverse. And with the uh, gauge potential also transforming in the usual way, the Lagrangian I wrote down for you is then gauge invariant. So this is the quantum mechanics. If you think about it a little bit, it's easy to factor out one scale, overall scale, which sits in front of the Hamiltonian, um, lambda, and uh, everything else is then dimensionless in units of lambda. So basically this Hamiltonian has one scale, and the quantum mechanics is strongly, the quantum mechanics, I should have perhaps written the second part first, the strong, uh, the quantum mechanics is strongly coupled when the energies, sorry, are smaller than the scale lambda. That's when the quantum mechanics or matrix theory is strongly coupled. And that is also corresponds to um, at least part of the conditions we got for the supergravity solution to be under control in type 2a. When on the other hand, the matrix theory gets weakly coupled, which is at high enough energies compared to lambda, then the gravity theory gets highly curved and you can't work with just supergravity. You have to work with all of string theory, which is more complicated. So we want to stick to the gravity region where you have a smooth space time and we want to try and understand it from the quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's the setting. Now at finite temperature, very quickly, you all know that the thermodynamics of the system is that uh, many of you know, in terms of the scale lambda, you get a um, energy which goes like temperature in units of lambda to this power four fifths, uh, 14 fifths with a, with a coefficient 7.41. And it's very impressive, as I said, that this is in fact reproduced by numerics. I think this is amazing. And some of the authors are here. Um, and you know, this is a proof of ADS-CFT, the proof that in fact the smooth geometry is emerging from quantum mechanics, which has nothing to do with supersymmetry, etc. Uh, but it, it, it's very impressively shown by some of you. And I have to just show this plot once. I learned about this plot actually in an ICTS lecture by Maldasen, and I was telling Masanori when I saw it, blew my mind and I said, I have to do something to go back and talk to all of you. So I'm really thrilled that I'm able to give this talk. And as you'll see very quickly, um, and many of you know, after you fit along with corrections, you extract a coefficient for the 14 fifths power, which actually agrees within about 7% to 7.41. So it's a very, very impressive check. And what we want to do is 
hopefully develop things enough so that we can instead so if of I, if i'm allowed to make some comment yeah, uh, uh, actually uh, one of the person in the audience Juni Shimura taught me yeah. this uh, project and he oh. uh, took me to <laughs> he taught uh, about the new breaks and we started together oh, oh i see uh, yeah okay, in, in this sorry. paper he wasn't uh, he, the cause of it uh, yeah oh, I see, I see. okay i stand corrected so uh, thank you and uh, very nice uh, to have you also here Jun. and uh, Really, it is beautiful. And what we really want to do is, you know, as I said, we have a proposal. It may not fully be fleshed out, but develop it to a point where it can be compared with the bulk so that you'll see there's a coefficient similar to 7.41, which, if we are correct, should come out of the quantum mechanics. Uh, it's uh, 200 and something in our case. And it would be just fantastic if we can bring it to a point where that can be tested numerically but I'll get there soon. Okay, now let's get going with defining what target space entanglement is in the boundary theory. Often for a field theory, and I'll connect to Ryutaki and Nagina, often for a field theory, say in D spatial dimensions, one can consider some subregion of RD, shown say here in red, and we want to know how entangled are the field theory degrees of freedom in this red region with those outside. Now, if the field theory is a conformal field theory on the boundary of ADS, then in beautiful work done by Ryu and Takianagi, uh, we have learned that in fact, this entanglement entropy of the boundary theory equals the area in units of 4G Newton, but now it's the area of the Ryu Takianagi surface. This surface is drawn so that it ends on the boundary of the red region in the boundary, and it minimizes the area subject to that constraint. So it's a minimum area or extremal surface. And you take the area of that surface again in units of 4G Newton. And that gives you the entanglement entropy. Now, this is entanglement entropy in a field theory of some part of the total space with the rest. Okay. We are dealing with quantum mechanics, which doesn't extend in any spatial direction. So this concept directly doesn't apply for our system. And really that was the starting point of our thinking. What kind of entanglement can we define then, uh, which can probe the connection with bulk and bulk entanglement, given that we have a quantum mechanics, okay? Um, and so that was the question. Intuitively, you might expect, well, you have quantum mechanics, but as I was saying, there are order n square degrees of freedom. It's some kind of entanglement in these n square degrees of freedom, which should take the place of that entanglement between the degrees of freedom in the field theory in some part and the rest. But how do you make this precise in some kind of gauge invariant way? Uh, and uh, I'll be telling you about some of our work. There's also work by others, Mezeng and Renard, a more recent paper by uh, Albion Lawrence and his collaborators, which are also important, which I won't uh, perhaps go into in as much detail. Now, you see, to go back to the issue of gauge invariance, you might say, I'm, if I have an N by N matrix, I'll just take some, say M by M block and uh, talk about how entangled it is with the rest. But that's not a gauge invariant notion because a UN gauge transformation will mix up these degrees of freedom with the others. So how do you pose this question of color entanglement in a gauge invariant way? And in fact, and this is what was interesting to us when we started thinking about it, just actually keeping the bulk in mind allowed us to come up with a gauge invariant notion. Now in the bulk, the kind of question we are interested in, as I was saying, was you take the bulk, say some direction x1, how entangled are the degrees of freedom in x1 greater than say a, some number a with the rest? That's the kind of question you're interested in. Now this suggests that you look at the target space, correspondingly the matrix x1, okay? And um, ask uh, how entangled are the degrees of freedom, the color degrees of freedom, in the region which correspond in some sense to the region x1 greater than a with x1 less than a. Now, what do I mean by that more precisely? Let's diagonalize the matrix x1. You can always diagonalize um, any one matrix doing a un transformation, which is a gauge symmetry. So let me diagonalize that. And here are the n eigenvalues. Now I can say, uh, let's say we are in a sector 
where m of the eigenvalues meet the constraint that they are greater than a okay let's say that's that is the sector we happen to be in now it's clear that there is the, that m is special we can do a further gauge transformation and we need it to make these m as the first m eigenvalues and having done that we can then for the remaining matrices okay um uh, so, so for for the uh, for the remaining matrices which are not diagonal in general we can start keeping the corresponding blocks okay so um i'm getting a little so here so what we can do is uh, we've arranged it so that as far as x1 is concerned the first m eigenvalues are meeting our constraint our target space constraint we call it target space because x1 is a target space field there's no re no space in quantum mechanics uh, in which the quantum mechanics lives it only lives in time but x1 is a target space degree of freedom so uh, m eigenvalues met the constraint we keep the corresponding say m by m block of matrices of all the matrices x2 to xn even the fermionic ones this is a gauge invariant way of keeping color degrees of freedom okay and then we ask how entangled are these degrees of freedom with the rest the blue degrees with the red degrees of freedom and this will be our notion then of target space entanglement now more correctly this is one version of a definition there's another version we can also give and i'll turn to the second version in a minute so um but anyway we keep in this version one we keep these m by m blocks and ask what is the entanglement entropy okay of these blocks with the rest and then what is by, by uh, and and we compute for that basically we'll compute the uh, density matrix for these color degrees of freedom in these m by m blocks and then compute its von neumann entropy okay let me just go back for a second in case i skipped something here so how entangled are the first m eigenvalues with the rest this is a gauge invariant question um, in in this sector and as i said the resulting von neumann entropy is the target space entanglement and it will of course arise due to this color entanglement okay now there are two versions i gave you the first version which i was showing you where you keep these m by m blocks but in the second version what you do is you keep the m by m block and also the off diagonal blocks okay which are n minus m times m dimensional if it's the b block um, uh, in terms of the uh, the column and row or the other way around um, where the uh, where the column here, I guess, uh, the, 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 I always get confused. The, it's the other way around. It's N minus M times M. This is M times N minus N. So B, C and A have to be kept. And you ask how entangled are these degrees of freedom with the N minus M times N minus M block, which you sort of integrate out. Okay. So this is version two of the proposal. And in either case, you compute the uh, density matrix of the degrees of freedom you keep and its entanglement entropy uh, by which i mean its von neumann entropy now this happened if m of the eigenvalues for x1 lay in the region of interest in general there will be some amplitude given a wave function that there is either no eigenvalue one two three all the way up to n you have to compute in each case the entanglement entropy and then sum the total entanglement entropy from all sectors to obtain finally the full target space entanglement which is in fact related to this constraint that x1 was greater than say a okay so in this way okay so you sum over all the various sectors uh, this is the answer for one sector you then sum it over m goes from zero to n because there's also a chance that you have no eigenvalue lying in the region of interest and this total answer then which is both total and target space entanglement so t stands for both things so this gives us then the full target space entanglement um, in in our system so this is the definition um, and let me illustrate it with some figures and then i'll stop to to take uh, to take some questions um, so let's suppose we are in a system where there are many brains here i won't try to count them uh, but um, you know four of them one two three four meet the condition that x1 is greater than zero now this is a picture in terms of brains but you can also think of this in terms of the eigenvalues for the x1 matrix 
okay so let's say the four of the eigenvalues of the x1 matrix are meeting the constraint here the constraint i've taken to be x1 greater than zero so i took that parameter a earlier to be just zero so four meet them so what you'll do is you'll keep the degrees of freedom among these four brains and you will not keep the degrees of freedom among the remaining brains this is version one of our proposal so all these degrees of freedom strings if you like running between these brains are what you'll keep these strings in the quantum mechanics you can think of as various degrees of freedom in the adjoint matrices going from one mat one uh, eigenvalue to another uh, etc if need be uh, so these degrees of freedom you'll keep you won't keep any corresponding degrees of freedom among the brains which are not lying in the region of interest okay and um, and then you'll ask so those that's what you'll keep and the entanglement you're interested in is between the degrees of freedom you're keeping and those you're not keeping okay that's the entanglement you're interested in that's the entanglement that this formula of ours obtained by summing in this case by by keeping the four brain sector m equals four sector will give us and then there'll be possibilities with various number of brains and you'll get corresponding contributions from various sectors similarly in version two you keep the the blue uh, degrees of freedom running between the brains but you also keep the off diagonals which are these black degrees of freedom running between the four brains meeting the constraint and the others which don't meet the constraint but you don't keep any degrees of freedom just running between the brains which are outside the region of interest okay those you don't keep the rest you keep so these strings going between or these off diagonal entries were like those off diagonal blocks of us so this is the difference between the two but in either case there's a precise density matrix and a precise von neumann entropy you get out of that which gives us our target space entanglement. Okay. And, and sorry, Sam, go ahead. Sam, may I just ask, is it is it Please. sort of clear from this picture that this will go like n squared? Because you know, think, thinking naively in terms of the strings between the brains. Right. That's a great question. Uh, and that is, you know, you might think if there's sufficient entanglement, right, between the various color degrees of freedom then generically you will uh, given any constraint of this type you'll have about half the eigenvalues in the region of interest and they will be entangled with the remaining degrees of freedom so the half uh, eigenvalues will correspond to some block of order n by two square say and the entanglement you'll get will be of order n square but this depends to be on there being sufficient entanglement you know if perhaps you are in a state where you have no entanglement worthwhile so to speak of among different degrees of freedom then it might be quite different and uh, actually exploring just the scaling with n square of this target space entanglement for various trial wave functions is already pretty interesting and not so trivial as we are finding out we are trying to get go uh, get going on, on this type of question and and it, it's not so easy not not so simple but you're right i mean the hope at least is that uh, the for a sufficiently entangled system which a strongly coupled theory might well have for its ground state uh, then you, the answer should go like n square and, and that and, would, uh, yeah. and, and so when they're all far separated the brains you can do these one loop calculations presumably and, and get some uh, some answer in that limit yeah you you could do that but you know the super gravity limit corresponds to a, yes. the, the bound state being strong. yeah 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 but you could you could look at when that breaks down and what the behavior looks like it's doing there yeah that's an excellent question and you could do that and you could build up from there right uh, go to that point in the coulomb branch and then then build up from there exactly exactly and and that, that's a, that's a good way to to start getting going on the problem that's right that's right uh, see how it scales and then go from there and that's sort of the kind of some of the things we are beginning to do i'm sorry i don't have more concrete answers yet uh because you have to keep uh, all parameters under control and so on but yes that's a good place to start i agree um and I think, yeah. go ahead go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, please uh, go ahead. i i thought the danger okona also wants to ask some question mm -hmm. so well, I, I just wanted to, to uh, i'm wondering if um I, if i look at the pp wave uh, the uh, yeah. the mn model yeah 
There I can go to large mu, the large mass parameter, which becomes yes. perturbative. Yes. Again, yes. you're moving away from the supergravity, but the scaling should become yes. clear there because you're just dealing with Gaussians. That's right. That's a great question. Again, great comment. Indeed, actually, that's sort of where we are starting, to be honest. We are starting in, in the calculations we're beginning to do uh, with just the mass terms turned on. Uh, so it's a quadratic Hamiltonian, uh, easy to do. Uh, and then add the quartic interaction sort of perturbatively and see how the end scale scaling goes, uh, the, the end scaling with n goes. Uh, so that's right, that's right. Uh, I, I think that should be tractable uh, for at least suitable target space constraints to do the, the quadratic theory. And then it'll be very interesting. We are yet to sort of even fully understand that, but it'd be very interesting to then add the quartic interaction the commutator square terms and see how, how the answer sort of develops or changes. Uh, thank you. Right. But again, I'm, I'm really sorry. I We should have driven some of these uh, toy calculations through already so I could tell you a little more, but we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, and we are sort of getting going there. So um, hopefully in a month or so. Yeah. But thank you. Uh, um, Masanori, anything from your side? Sorry, I wasn't sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I just wanted to ask about the setup. So you, you have, so basically you, the situation you are interested in is a ground state. Yes. Yes. Wave, wave function. And you imagine that that ground state is some uh, sort of a linear superposition of uh, various uh, matrix values. Uh, right, right. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and you're uh, diagonalizing each of them. And, right. Uh, and okay, so so fix a gauge. Okay, okay. And yeah. once fi once fixing the gauge, then uh, if that's a well legitimate procedure, then once fixing the gauge, then after that it's kind of a uh, any point or the or non-local lattice, and just use the definition of entanglement entropy you and the collaborators did several years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Even here, right? And uh, the the definition we are giving here, say. But that's correct. That's correct. Once you fix the gauge, I think you get a local ham, uh, Hamiltonian on the lattice, and you can try to just solve it as you know well, and then right. just use this uh, precise definition. But the definition is not very easy to implement. But I think we should be able to do that. So, in, right. and in in this case, so you can uh, so if this uh, uh, definition is correct, then you can diagonal in general. You can diagonal only one of the matrices, so you can. Uh, separate, uh, you can uh, separate the region to two, uh, you know, just uh, by plane, but uh, other than that, more complicated shape cannot be defined this way. Right, right, right. So I was actually just coming to that. So in fact, just for simplicity, I discussed the case of say x1 bigger than zero or a or something, but actually you can deal with a more general constraint. Uh, say, suppose, uh, you know, you had a general constraint f of the matrices greater than zero, because um, you know, all the matrices as operators, right, quantum operators commute with each other. And so you could simply choose to diagonalize this combination, the one which appears in the constraint. For example, as con for concreteness, if you had a quadratic constraint, you could choose to diagonalize this combination of all matrices. And um, that's a perfectly uh, valid gate choice. Uh, and then work with that combination F as diagonal, implement the constraint again, sector by sector, and then go forward. So, so for clarification, it's essential that one deals with the zero temperature theory. Ah, no, is that correct? Actually, I was, that was my next slide. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. So in fact, you know, the zero temperature theory means your density matrix to begin with is, is, is just sub, uh, ket, sabra, uh, psi, psi, ket, psi, bra. But you could equally well work with a more general density matrix, say a thermal density matrix. And then again, look at this density matrix sector by sector uh, and integrate out the unwanted degrees of freedom to obtain the reduced density matrix and compute its uh, von Neumann entropy. So really the, the ground state only gives you in a sense uh, a particular choice for the beginning density matrix in the full Hilbert space, but you could equally well do it for finite temperature and actually i mean perhaps the finite temperature calculations might be easier to do also numerically as some of you were mentioning in some of the discussions so in that case of course you won't just have the entanglement entropy you'll have some combination of thermal and 
and quantum fluctuations whose, enti whose entropy you're computing, but it still will have, one would hope, some reasonable component of the entanglement. And anyway, the notion of target space entropy will certainly apply here too, and, and you, could, you could do the calculations. Yeah. Um, well, then, go ahead, please. What is the concept of area here? I'm sorry? What is the concept of area over here? Once you have calculated the entangle entropy, uh, you got to equate it to some kind of an area, right? Uh, area. In order to make connection with the yeah. Yeah. So uh, say at finite temperature, your geometry will not be, you know, the zero brain, uh, zero temperature geometry. It will be the black hole in in the zero brain geometry, um, for which we have written oh, wow. down the energy formula, which at that temperature to the fourteen fifths. Um, and so that's okay. the geometry we would start with. We would look at the corresponding region in the bulk, which corresponds to this constraint, and then ask about the transverse area in Newton's constant units. Okay, okay. is that okay? And there's one more question in the chat Please. window. Can you read? Oh. Okay, one second. Or maybe, it's a, Vamika, maybe she can uh, just uh, unmute and uh, ask question. I'm um, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, so you basically talked about the entanglement entropy, and in that you gave a formula where we were basically considering the area, um, the transverse area, um, to the yes. boundary that you were considering. But later you replaced that area with some um, area um, um, RT that was Ryu Tanayagi, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would just want to know that if this choice was somehow like related to that M cross M matrix and, it, and its entanglement, that version one and version two of the choice of the matrices and its entanglement of the matrix blocks. So yeah. is that particular choice of area, does that um, basically is being incorporated from this particular choice of matrices and the entanglement that is happening? Because I'm very new to this area, so I'm really not... Um, yeah. the, well, you know, the uh, comments on the Ryu Takianagi formula was really for those who've been thinking about this, because as I was saying, this is a concept which arises when you have a field theory. Um, here we have quantum mechanics, so it's actually quite different. And the concept of target space entanglement we are using here and defining is quite different. Uh, but it also... Uh, will uh, be related, we propose, to an area in the bulk. However, it is different from the Ryu Takenagi case. There, the area which arises is for an extremal surface, which meets certain boundary conditions, which are tied to a field theory in which we are keeping some spatial region and not the rest. And here we have quantum mechanics. We are asking a different type of question, and we are getting a different type of area but it's still an area. So uh, there's a sort of similarity, but actually conceptually there's quite a bit of difference. Oh, okay, so maybe don't pay too much attention to the Ryu Takenagi part, except it's, very, it's important in the general development of this kind of story, but don't pay too much attention because it's not closely tied to what I'm saying today, okay? But Thank actually that know. brings up an, an obvious comment, which is, was it, do you understand how you would blend what you're doing now with something like the RT formula? I mean, once you go to field theory, once you discuss something other than zero brains, you're going to have to somehow marry what you've done Yes. in the zero case to you know, a real field theory case. There should be some natural way of, of yeah. sort of blending the two somehow. Yes, that's right, that's right. That's a great question again. And uh, maybe my collaborators would like to add something, but I don't think we understand too well the corresponding story in the bulk. Um, and what I would say is there is a boundary definition of this kind of generalized notion where you are keeping both a constraint in target space right. and a constraint in base space, you know, the space where the field theory mm -hmm. lives, so that you could say, I'm only going to keep the degrees of freedom in some region of space where the field theory lives. And for those degrees of freedom further impose the condition that only some part of their target space is what I will access. And, and then come up with a notion of entanglement associated with those constraints. And that I think is a precise thing, but what will it map to in the bulk? Because it'll have to blend both things is, is less clear right. at least to me. And I think it's an important question and 
part of trying to understand our proposal vis-a-vis -vis the bulk hopefully will shed light and also uh, partly trying to connect our proposal to extremal surfaces which we haven't been able to do um, you know uh, the bulk area as i was saying is some transverse area it doesn't have to be an extremal surface of any type um, but if if that's the case uh, what's special about extremal surfaces from this perspective that kind of a question also is an open mm -hmm. one and we need to understand that better and that should help in this kind of blending but that's right we don't understand the answer to your question today i don't know if shumit and gautam would like to say something. yeah can i make a comment i mean you might have thought that uh this has something to do with picking regions on the s5 the the sphere but it doesn't quite translate directly to that yeah you know yeah uh, i mean you but i think i'm still hopeful you can choose constraints such that that happens in which case one might be able to get a more direct uh, uh, relationship but as sandeep said that you know we are a bit uh, too early in the game for that too confused yeah yeah may may i may i make a comment um please it, it it's just that um i guess all of this comes down to how is the bulk geometry encoded in the in the field theory yeah. uh which is always the the big question and i suppose for example taking a geometric constraint as you were that the that the trace of the the squares of the matrices is less than r mm. you might want to say that you're looking at the entanglement of a ball of size r mm -hmm. but that's in the picture where these the eigen values of the matrices are sort of positions of d brains mm -hmm. but in this large n decoupling limit where you have the supergravity dual Mm -hmm. the flat space that the d brains in is deformed into these complicated uh, near horizon geometries and and that's the process i suppose we don't really understand well right. so it's it's not obvious how to map the constraints on the matrices into real uh, geometric understanding in the bulk true true that's right that's right i think that's again a very good comment and it could be that there is some imprecision in our map you know especially when it comes to finite temperatures etc yeah um at zero temperature one might say that the mapping of the coulomb branch etc which I, I was going to come to uh, provides a kind of map between target space and uh, bulk um uh, which perhaps could still be corrected but at least seems on somewhat reasonable footing and there's additional evidence that you know the force which you compute on a moving brain in the bulk is reproduced by calculations in the boundary theory uh, which can be cal calculated correctly also after you retain operators uh, which meet the target space constraint as i will be discussing in a minute so there is some partial evidence that uh, what we are talking about does map to Uh, measurements you can do in the bulk on probe brains in the corresponding region of interest but you know uh, all of this might be more complicated uh, especially when you go to finite temperatures etc um, or just because of large n effects and uh, to some extent we might find out in a somewhat iterative way where we try to do the calculations and try to see what needs to be corrected but roughly since we are talking about it roughly in my mind what i have in in mind is the following uh, because this is also something that numerically some of you have tried to do take to map a, a target space constraint to a bulk region uh, try to take a probe eigen value in the boundary theory and see what kind of a effective potential or force it sees and try to map that to the force a corresponding probe brain would see in the bulk and that is a sort of way to you know map a constraint in the bulk to the boundary and then i would say um i might be sticking my neck out but i would say that perhaps a, a refined version of the proposal would be carry out that map which might need you to do numerics and then the target space entanglement will be the bulk entanglement with that kind of map so that might be a, a more precise version that could come out as we go ahead 
let, let me comment. So, so I, I think the issue Toby mentioned is not can be resolved, but uh, Sandeep hasn't uh, been convinced yet. So first I convince Sandeep and then I will convince Toby. <laughs> and another comment is that, uh, so you don't have to use it to D0 brain and you can use it to D3 brain. In that case, probably having a good dual gravity description, you can really Higgs uh, D3 brain. And maybe precisely you can use this notion, I guess. Yeah. Of course, whether we can actually do calculation using a lattice is a different issue. But conceptually, at least in some cases, you can avoid conflict between the issue to be raised and the. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. May maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. No. No. We are, I should say that we have been having very interesting discussions with Masanori. And so I, by the way, so I'm a chair and I noticed that an hour passed, but how long do you need to wrap up the talk? So, so uh, I'm running a bit behind, but that's okay. I just, we still have a 30 minute discussion section. We can go into discussion section and you can just go to at least 15 minutes. That's fine. That's fine. What I'll do is I, I'll try to wrap this up um, and you can ask your questions. And then if you start running out of time, I'll just come to the punchline because I'm all, I've almost explained the, the okay. ideas, um, but I'm sorry, I'm not finishing on time. I, I hope you'll give me a little leeway. But uh, in about 10, 10 minutes, I'll, I'll try to try to get through the rest. Okay. Um, okay, so let me go on here. Uh, so these are the two versions. And I think I've said almost everything uh, about about uh, the definition. There's a way to, I have a formula about explicitly integrating out the degrees of freedom, but it just uh, an equation which will be hard to read. And it just carries out what I said pictorially in terms of which strings to keep and which not to. Okay, now just very briefly, you know, there's another way to think about entanglement entropy, which is actually quite beautiful and really quite deep which is instead of integrating out degrees of freedom, you ask about what measurements you want to do, okay? So for example, uh, if you have um, say two spin halves, uh, you can say, I want to compute how entangled one is with respect to another by integrating out one of the spins. But instead you can say, suppose I want to only carry out measurements on one of the two spins. Then I'm restricting myself to some sub-algebra of all observables. And I can ask the question of entanglement by saying the density matrix I'm interested in must lie in this subalgebra and must give the correct expectation value for all observables in the subalgebra. Then again, you get the same entropy you would have got in this simple example uh, as you would have got by integrating out. So, so this is a way to think about entanglement entropy through uh, measurements or subalgebras where the entanglement measures the the ignorance or the disorder you have because you're not keeping all observables in your system okay so it's a slightly different way of thinking about it but just to say this is a conceptually useful way and you can cast everything we are doing in a completely gauge invariant elegant manner using this notion of sub algebras and so on and 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 it all goes through and it's kind of elegant you have to define appropriate projectors which basically project to the correct color degrees of freedom, but you can do that in a gauge invariant way using the target space constraint and then construct uh, uh, manifestly gauge invariant operators. So I ran through that, but I just want to leave you with this uh, general idea that you can make the notion of gauge invariance quite manifest using subalgebras. Okay, so 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 far we define target space entanglement. I've already told you how to relate it to bulk entanglement. You take a target space constraint and you map it to the corresponding bulk constraint. And then our proposal, as I was saying, is that this target space entanglement we have defined in fact becomes bulk entanglement is equal to when you have a smooth geometry, the area of the boundary region in units of four times g newton. So that's the precise proposal. This you compute from geometry, this you compute from the target space entanglement uh, calculation, and the two should agree. That's the proposal. Okay. Um, um, I had some more about moduli space of Coulomb branch and so on. I said some of that in words. Uh, let me just briefly tell you, as I was mentioning, there's a Coulomb branch here. You can take brains move them in the bulk because of the supersymmetry. They don't experience any force till they're not moving. That maps one-to-one -one with 
the vacua in the system. You can then start moving these brains. They experience a force. You can show, uh, for example, one of them is moving around. Uh, you can show that that force is correctly captured by an effective action you can compute in the quantum mechanics. And this effective action can be written in terms of the projected operators in the subalgebra. If the brain is in the region of interest meeting the constraint, you can show that the projected operators, that their effective action will correctly reproduce the force on the brain. So that's the kind of evidence we can give by mapping the Coulomb branch to a particular uh, uh, sector in terms of waves in the, field, in the quantum mechanics and, and mapping potentials to forces, suggests that we might be on the right track in this proposal. Although, of course, as I said, it has to be explored further. Okay, concrete tests. You can take the system at finite temperature. I'm sorry if this formula has not come out too clearly. You can take two different temperatures. We do this to get rid of regions where supergravity breaks down. As long as both temperatures are small compared to lambda, this underlying scale in the theory, the gravity calculation is well defined. And you can uh, take some region like x1 greater than a, and you can get from the gravity side, the area formula, you get an answer. It goes like n square. It goes like uh, the constraint value A to some characteristic power, goes like temperature again to 14 fifths, the difference. Uh, and with a coefficient B naught, which is 260.5 here. Okay, and so this is a prediction. If what we are saying is correct, this is a prediction. And uh, well, you guys are really strong, so you can do the calculation in the boundary theory and we can see whether it's true or whether things need to be modified. We have two proposals, as you know, we have version one and two where you keep the off diagonals or not. So one or the other, we hope, will be correct. It will give us n square and the coefficient will match. Okay, that's, that's a proposal, a, a, a question, but I hope you will find it interesting. Just to say, you know, this fact itself that it's the area in units of Newton's constant was important to get an answer which made sense in the boundary theory. Someone else might have said, I'm going to take area and string units. That would not have given a result which is natural in terms of the boundary theory quantities. The boundary theory has, this, has n and it has lambda, but it doesn't have other combinations. And the, if you take g newton in the denominator, you get the right combinations. Otherwise, you get scales which you wouldn't be able to understand in the boundary theory. Okay, how would you do the calculation in the boundary theory? Well, you can compute the density matrix by doing a path integral over uh, a circle for finite time. You have to keep track of various trajectories. This is quantum mechanics, so you're summing over paths. You have to sum over various paths and keep various permutations. Again, this is just a schematic diagram. Don't take it too seriously, showing that you have to keep various permutations which mix. So you do a path integral on a circle that gives you a density matrix. Then from the density matrix, you trace out the unwanted degrees of freedom to compute the density matrix of the relevant degrees of freedom. And from that, the von Neumann entropy. So in principle, it's a, it's a concrete calculation, but of course doing it for n big enough and so on is I'm sure very non-trivial, but it's a concrete calculation hopefully can be done. Okay, that brings me to the end. I'll, I'll summarize in just five minutes or less than that. Numerical methods have made very impressive progress and hopefully they will allow us to understand the connection between entanglement entropy in the boundary and the bulk in the specific context, say, of zero brains where we are dealing with this notion which we define today of target space entanglement. I think they are fairly concrete kind of tests which can be done. We have given a precise definition. There are two versions. Hopefully one of them will agree with the bulk um, and propose that they, one of them agrees with the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Maybe it needs, the proposal needs sharpening and one big issue which came up was how to map the bulk constraint to the boundary constraint. Maybe by using forces on brains, we can try to make this map precise. Maybe Masanori already knows how to do this well. So that'll be great. But in any case, I think perhaps that mapping of constraints we can try to do in one in a precise way through potentials of forces and then see whether the target space entanglement is agreeing with the area. So that, if you like, is the more general form of the proposal. 
Okay, um, many more things need to be understood better from the bulk point of view. Exactly what kinds of bulk measurements is our target space entanglement including? I said you can think of entanglement through operators. What kind of bulk operators are being included in it? That's something we need to understand better. I said the, the force on brains is being captured, but what else? You know, that kind of a question so that we need to do better. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll skip over this. Uh, and and uh, just, um, you know, some of the other questions, does gravity play the role of, of a uh, code space now for the color degrees of freedom as well, uh, like has been proposed for the uh, field theory degrees of freedom, what's the role of extremal surfaces, etc. All of that, uh, look forward to discussing more with you in the future. Let me just end by acknowledging support from TIFR, which gets its funding from the Department of Atomic Energy, also the Infosys Foundation and the Department of Science and Technology. Thanks a lot and sorry for going over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there any question, comment, yes, discussion? Yes, a lot of questions. <laughs> well, go ahead, David. Um, Entanglement entropy usually has this property that the entanglement entropy of a region is equal to the entanglement entropy of the complement of the region. Right, right, right. But with your proposal on the matrices, that cannot happen. The complement of A would be the B proposal and the complement of, right? The, 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 so, so, so there, yeah. So I, what, what does happen is if you keep the M by M block, then the remaining three blocks have the same entanglement with the m by m block. So you can either compute it from the m by m or the remaining. So that equality is still there for any pure state. But what is not true is that the entanglement in version one and two will be equal. That is, if you had kept the three blocks, including the top, that will not be the same as the three blocks, including the bottom. No, I, I, that, that, that's why I was trying to, to understand how you resolve that. Uh, no, they general. are different, and that's why I said, you know, we don't, we have two proposal, versions of the proposal. They will give different answers in general, you're right. Well, we are hoping one of them will give us the area law. We are not sure which one, but this indicates, as you correctly draw attention to, the fact that we are not very precise in our understanding as yet, you know. Um, we were not able to a priori decide whether integrating out the off diagonals is a more natural thing to do from the point of view of the bulk or not. Maybe a little more thought will lead us there, but at least I wasn't sure maybe my collaborators have more to say. Uh, that's why uh, we have these two proposals. So- um, Can, I, can yeah. I make a comment? Yeah, yeah. So, so David, the way we define the, um, the density matrix, the fact that the, um, the entanglement of you know, one set of degrees of freedom is the same as entanglement entropy of one set of degrees of freedom is the same as the entanglement uh, of the the remaining degrees of freedom is quite explicit for, for pure states, of course, right? Uh, but as Sandeep was saying, whether, I mean, that so the definition clearly keeps that, but I think the question of whether uh, which one is satisfies our conjecture is a, I think it's sort of slightly different issue. Right, right, right. So just let me just show that for a minute. I have it here. So, you know, if you take this version where you're keeping A, B, and C, A, B, and C will have the same entanglement as D. That is true, manifestly. But uh, this is different from just keeping this. If you just keep this top block, that will have a different entanglement. This top block will have the same entanglement as three, three reds. But the top block will be different in general from these three blocks, you know? So that that's certainly the case. And uh, we don't know which one, hopefully one of them will agree with the area law. Yeah. I, I have another question, which is also technical. Um, Please. When you sum over M. Yes. You, you had these kind of density matrices, are those normalized or, or, or ah. they're not normalized and there's some probabilities in there? They're, they're not normalized, that's correct. And so the normalization of each of them is the probability to find M eigenvalues meeting oh, the okay. constraint. That's right. And yeah, that's right. And, and 
Right. And that's part of what goes goes into that trace row log row. The full density matrix which includes all the sectors is normalized. Is normalized, is normalized, but each of them is normalized to give the probability. Right. Thanks. So, okay, then, then Joe. Yes, I'm, I'm slightly confused as to the areas that would be considered in the bulk. It, they, all of the areas that look natural uh, look like they would be infinite in the bulk. Yeah. Which. Yes, that is, that is true. Uh, but uh, what is also true is that, you know, in this model, uh, the gravity description becomes unreliable after you go a certain distance. Uh, let me try um, and bring that up. Uh, uh, here we go. So, um, you know, in, in this geometry, um, after you, if R, the radial di direction becomes big, too big, uh, so when it becomes, say, of order GSN to the one third, then the supergravity description becomes unreliable. So, um, you know, we can only use the area formula if the surface of interest lies in that region. Now, as you point out, if you're using a constraint like X greater than A, we chose that kind of linear constraint because in a sense it was conceptually simplest. But if you are literally using that, then the area is going to extend and go past the region where R meets this constraint. So then how do we compute the area? We can't really compute it reliably using the supergravity solution. And that was the reason why we took a difference in temperatures to quote a, a prediction. Because if you take the difference of the areas at two temperatures, then that region, uh, which is lying beyond um, the uh, region where supergravity is reliable drops out in the difference. And so we believe that that difference, I'm trying to find that, that difference is reliably given by the difference in the areas. And that we can then hopefully compare with the corresponding target space constraint result. Um, so that was the thinking. Yes, that that looks that looks natural. That would correspond to putting in two different sized black holes in the dual geometry. Right, right. right. Okay. And then comparing. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Then Toby. Oh, just a, a quick follow up to that, and then I've got another question. Uh, I mean, you could presumably just take a region that was bounded between two values of R. You could do that absolutely, and, and yeah. yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And we okay. did that actually. I didn't show that formula, but we did that in in our paper. You you can be even at zero temperature, but just look at some region, and that way get rid of of the unwanted region. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Um, but, now, uh, one. So this is a this is maybe a comment that may be crazy, but one thing that we find very hard is simulating the supersymmetric theories. Um, one thing that's much, much easier is to simulate the quenched or bosonic versions of those theories, which have been done to much better precision. Yeah. Now, of course, they don't have a good supergravity dual. Yeah. But I think a very interesting question is, do they have a geometric dual that may not be some simple Einstein gravity? Maybe it's some higher spin gravity. Who knows? We don't really understand that. Mm -hmm. But how does geometry emerge if it does, in those theories. I think that's a very interesting, almost more basic question than understanding the details of these supergravities. And so I wonder if you've thought about how, I mean, whether you just applied the same prescription in these quench versions, what sort of things you might expect to happen? You know, is there a diagnostic to see geometry coming out of some dynamical continuum geometry coming out, not of Einstein type? But. Mm -hmm. Maybe, and do, do you mean there's some notion of geometry, but it could be some higher spin analog? Yeah. And, um, some strongly curved, you know, I, I, it's, it's a bit like having strongly curves, you know, but I guess that the really interesting thing is having dynamical metric. Yeah. That's, that's in a sense what gravity is. Now, whether it's Einstein's equations yeah. precisely is, is then a detailed question. Yeah. But holography basically tells you there. Yeah. You know, it's about having a dual dynamical metric to a field theory. Yeah. And um, yeah, 
You know, I, I think this is a very interesting question. I agree with you. I don't have anything very concrete to say, maybe my collaborators do, but I can say this, you know, it's connected to the following, which is, could you have computed the analog of the area formula in the bulk I was writing down in string theory? You know, as in, uh, what calculation would we do in string theory to compute the corresponding entanglement? Now, the reason why it's interesting is if you think about it from the world sheet point of view, the space-time coordinates are also target space coordinates, you see. So you have another notion of target space entanglement playing out if you phrase the bulk question in string theory on the world sheet. And one of the things we would like to do better is understand that notion of target space entanglement and its connections to the boundary quantum mechanics target space entanglement. You know, but but regardless of that connection, I think uh, this notion, which has been explored, by the way, in work by Atish Dabolkar and more recently Edward Witten and so on, with sort of limited success. But I think it's worth sort of understanding better if we can push that more and understand the generalized notion of of this area law formula, say in on the string world sheet, then I think it'll get very interesting and we might be able to make your kind of question precise, Toby. Uh, and just one last thing, and then perhaps uh, my collaborators would like to say more. But you know, one of the challenges in my mind there is, if you're looking for a formula like area over G Newton, and you're trying to look at it perturbatively on the world sheet, you know, sometimes uh, L string is a more natural thing. So how do you quite get this uh, sort of things? Anyway, uh, we need to try and, and understand better. But yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a very right. interesting question. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Let, let me just make the comment that because, uh, as you say, there's a there's a, a, a um, the idea is entanglement is somehow geometry. Yeah. Now, for that to be an interesting statement, it must go beyond specifically having Einstein's equations. There must be something more to it than that. Mm -hmm. And so, by not necessarily looking at something governed by Einstein equations, but something more general, you might hope to learn something interesting using entanglement that you, you know. There could be something new there. If it isn't tied, if it is more tied to having Einstein's equations and so on, then it probably isn't a very interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Good point. Okay, okay. Yeah, so maybe we need to understand bulk entanglement also more generally and and then then try to develop this kind of a correspondence. Okay, good point. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it's a good uh, can I, can Go I, ahead, please, Gato. Comment, yeah. So I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, you can actually, um, you know, get the fermions out of the game by doing something like a shock schwartz compactification as is done in, uh, you know, this ADS QCD uh, kind of Sakai Sugimoto kind of models, mm -hmm. uh, which has been used in uh, to understand uh, high temperature uh, behavior of QCD mm -hmm. uh, in an ADS QCD kind of uh, model. So, uh, but there the problem is that the the region where you can you have a good uh, gravity description mm. is not the one where you have a good gauge theory description i mean in the sense that when you actually want to have uh, a weak coupling uh, controllable uh, gravity description then you are back to the original uh, uh, you know the supersymmetric uh, theory so there's a there's an interpolation so whatever results have been obtained I mean, of course, you guys uh, know it all, I, so I, I don't even have to say it. So where, whatever results have been obtained, they are in a region where, uh, you know, it's a string world sheet description, uh, which is uh, applicable and not the, uh, not the gravity description. So you can have in this setup, you can have a non-supersymmetric, uh, uh, you know, description of things. Mm, but you also are forced to use world sheet rather than uh, but, gravity. Yeah, I think in order, oh, yes, in order to look at local geometry, I think you will need the fermions. Um, it, so put, putting things on a circle with Schwartz and reducing yeah. uh, is a sort of global, it's a global issue and, and, and of course gaps the system, but it doesn't change the local geometry physics and and I think that's more associated to the higher energies as you say 
uh, where the fermions are still important. Okay, maybe, I mean, now that I think people are understanding ADS-3, CFT-2 better, maybe that's a framework where, you know, one could have a controlled understanding without supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. Can I come I mean, in with a comment? Um, yeah. I, I don't quite see the relevance of fermions for back lo locality. I think it's large N, which is important, rather than fermions. I mean, why, why are fermions important? I think the fermions are important in the usual models in order to recover the supergravities. But I totally agree with you. In order to have a geometric dual, it's unclear you need fermions. But I guess we don't have an example where it's just two derivative gravity where the, the field theory doesn't have fermions. Well, and if we don't have supersymmetry, we don't have control to check it, except in lattice models. Some of that, the that's the point. But I mean, one of the key things you need to do is have a weak curvature to the space. There are two aspects to a dual geometry. One is having continuum physics. You need a large number of degrees of freedom. But one, the other is that if you want weakly curved description, that supersymmetry seems to play the role there in uh, keeping a weak curvature, at, at least in the DP brain models. I think you just need a uh, high uh, Taft uh, coupling. I don't think the supersymmetry is essential. You know, uh, yeah, let me just come in here, Costas. You might well have thought about this more, but every time I tried to construct ADSs with non supersymmetric fluxes, you know, as you know, uh, in, in non SUSY ADS, even a single uh, decay amplitude becomes infinite because of the growth of the volume you know mm. and um, you have to be really sure that the ads is not just meta stably stable but just absolutely stable and it's kind of virtually impossible given our technology of string theory today to rule out any possible meta stable decay so and you know n n now there's all this weak uh, What's all this, uh, this, uh, what's it called? Um, the problem, the biggest, uh, yeah. Gravity is the weakest force yeah. conjecture and all that, which also seems to, so anyway, bottom line is, at least as of a year or so ago, there was no flux compactification where people had shown that all metastable decay channels are ruled out. And, uh, you know, the, the ADS was long lived enough, you know. So, no, so, I mean, I, I, I'm not suggesting uh, it's easy to do uh, a setup with non specimetric uh, Compactifications is clearly not, um, yeah. but I would so, say you know if I want uh, kind of a proof of concept, I think it's probably easier if you start from the field theory and use kind of lattice methods to go to strong coupling because without supersymmetry, you cannot we simply cannot go to uh, to strong coupling. And then once you go to strong coupling, then you can check is, are these results compatible with some sort of bulk locality. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Costa. So uh, actually, now it's almost the time, and one person is raising a hand. So just to take a last question from Michael, and then go to break, and then still uh, Costa can <laughs> continue discussion. Is it fine? Yes, Absolutely. Okay. So go, uh, Michael. Oh yeah, I just had a quick question because uh, Gauda mentioned about the uh, cutoff in the lattice theory, which gave him a natural delta in uh, Sandeep's original formula. Mm -hmm. Well, in the in string theory, in, from the uh, world chief point of view, there is a, a cutoff in a sense for like Rindler space, because if you do thermal uh, calculations, uh, think of it as like a finite temperature, there is a uh, limiting type temperature. And uh, so that that variable, which is usually the acceleration in Rindler space, we have the horizon there. That's the two regions that gives you a natural cutoff just from the world chief point of view mm -hmm. in that case. And it is of order of Newton's constant in that case. So that was just a comment I want to make. Well, is it, you know, the, this is a good comment. And I think this is the kind of thing that Atish Dapulkar and more recently written also tried to explore. But is it about the Newton constant or the string con coupling, the, the string scale, the string length? Yeah, it, it's a, um, it's it's like the Hagedorn temperature, but it's a little, it's, a, it's, it's like one over pi, the Hagedorn temperature. So it does involve the string tension. And of course, to relate it to Newton's constant, you have to get the dilaton uh, expectation value, which of course is very difficult to compute from the world sheet point of view, you know, because yeah. you don't have a conservative. So I would say you can't, 
uh, you know, related directly to Newton's constant, but it's proportional, of course, dimensionless, which is always easy to do. The question is, do you get the right numerical factor, which is like what you've been emphasizing? And I think uh, what you're studying is a very excellent example where you might be able to get that numerical factor. The world chief point of view, I don't think we're able to get the numerical factor. You're right, you're right, Sandy. Yeah, no, but it's interesting. I, I think we need to understand the world sheet better too. I think that point is very well taken, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that comment. Then, uh, so let's uh, cross the discussion formally, uh, uh, cross the discussion section, but uh, session. But of course, you, you can continue during the break. So let's thank uh, Sandeep again. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great, great experience for me. Thank you. Uh, if you'll permit, I, I mean, if you'll permit, I will close now. Is that okay? Or do you want to talk more? I can stay around also. I don't know because some people have to eat lunch, dinner. Uh, yeah, yeah, so no, uh, so the people can uh, just leave on the uh, next session starting in 30 minutes, I think. And okay. the speaker is Costas, I think. Okay. And the uh, chair <laughs> is David Bernstein. And probably like uh, ten, five or 10 minutes before the session, uh, Costas has to check if uh, he can uh, share screen and so on. So in the meantime, in the meantime, if people are hungry, they can want to eat something, or people can just stay here and chat. Oh, okay. I I I need to get my caffeine, so I think I'll. Okay. <laughs> but I'll be right back. <clears throat> if if you will, I'll permit me. I may go and get something to eat. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, but, no but, problem. But, no but, problem. But, 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 but if you all want to talk, of course, I would be happy to do that. <laughs> 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 Since I'm, you know, it's really up to you all, but I mean, yeah, um, no, but I think, you know, the question, you know, your comments, both Masanori and Toby, they were really great. And, and, and I think they really put the finger on many important things. So let's try to think a little more. And thanks, Masanori, for engaging. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've not been able to understand your comments, but maybe you <laughs> explain them slowly to me. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> At my age, it has to right. be explained three times, and then it gets in. So maybe, and, and then you have to explain them to me, whatever they were. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, about the simulation, you know, there are several independent groups, but uh, at least one, of, if one of them can uh, find uh, some doable, tractable setup, then maybe things start working. I think. Yeah. Find, yeah. Finding some doable, uh, I mean, uh, simpler setup is important, I think. If yeah. Directly studying full D0 brain quantum mechanics from the beginning is probably hard. Yeah. And like Toby mentioned, if we can do bosonic model, it's much simpler. Yeah, I think it, the yeah. bosonic model is interesting because there's a phase transition at low temperature. Mm. And it could be that that's associated to not having a geometry to having a geometry. It may be the entanglement entropy goes from order one to order n squared, something very basic like that. Um, you, you, you know, uh, Toby, I was going to say this, uh, but we were sort of running out of time, that maybe one way to test whether you're getting a transition from no geometry to geometry is uh, if a kind of gap in the spectrum of anomalous dimensions develops. You know, the stress tensor is always protected. But if other things start getting heavy, because you're going towards strong coupling and there's no symmetry protecting them, uh, then you might say, oh, you know, you're moving towards a gravity description. But you know? I, th I think one has to be careful about whether it's Einstein gravity you're talking about okay, or just okay. a dynamical metric. Okay. I think for Einstein gravity, you need the separation because you have few Ooh. bulk degrees of freedom. Okay, you're right. for a more general local geometry in the bulk, it's unclear to me you need that separation. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Like so, for these uh, higher spin theories. Yes, yeah. So you mean maybe the tensionless limit or something? Try to try to do that. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. No. Did, can, I, can I ask you about the comment you just made a few minutes ago about the metastability? Yeah. Is that the volumes are getting large, but in ADS, using holographic minimization, the volume is always finite. So what is the... Uh, no, the, 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 the volume, no, no, but this is the, not the renormalized volume, uh, Costas, because what happens is you get a decay rate per unit volume in, in ADS, and... Uh, then what happens is you have to integrate over the entire ADS and just up till the cutoff. 
So uh, the maximum contribution comes from the cutoff. And if you start trying to take the cutoff to go to infinity, it just diverges with that volume. But I mean, why, but why not putting the, the counter terms? The counter terms should be there just on the, on, on, on the counts of uh, the variational problem. Yeah, but the counter terms all go like, you know, won't get rid of the, the decay, the total integrated decay. You know, um, they, they can uh, give you a, I agree, a term going like the area, which is also the volume, but the decay rate is just an integral over the bulk. Oh, you mean the, the spatial directions? You, you, yeah. So you get an infinity from, from the spatial directions, not, not from the radial integral. I see, I see, okay. Uh, well, no, it's, it's the, yeah, it's the, it's the uh, spatial directions, exactly. Whose volume is growing with the radial direction, you know? Uh, but, but that you can uh, get rid of using the counter terms. The, the radial infinity you can get rid by using the, uh, the counter terms. Now, of course, there is also an infinity if the spatial directions are infinite, then that gives you an infinity which is not cut off by uh, the, the use of counter terms. But the radial one, I, I don't think that should be a problem. The, the counter terms should always be there. It's, it's not just an issue in, in ADS. It just no, comes the from- the counter terms don't help with everything. You know, the counter terms do help with expectation values of local operators and so on. But the bulk volume divergence, you can't get rid of. That's not true. That's not true. There's a normalized formula, which is finite. Oh. I mean, the on shell value of the action is proportional to the volume of in ADS. Right? It's, uh, and the counter terms precisely normalize that. So. Okay, not for this. Well, the first paper which did this very carefully uh, is Orgera, Horowitz, and Polchinski. And uh, they did it for the Kaluza Klein uh, version, decay into nothing, but it's more general. And you can't get rid of this. You do the holographic renormalization, but the infinity remains from the decay rate. You know, so uh, you said it's Porchinsky. Is it you as well um, in the paper? I'll, I'll look at it after. Or Orgera, or, or Horowitz, and Polchinsky. Yeah, that was the first. Okay. first paper which, which does it? Yeah. Okay, we can talk more. We can talk more, but uh, I, I, I think, yeah. Go ahead. Since I just have a cup of coffee and I'm getting a little bit awake here in Boston, uh, I have a, a probably a, a naive question. But you know, if, if you think of uh, uh, Pure Yang Mills, Yuguchi Kawai, it, you can start with a lattice which has got spatial separation. And then as n goes to infinity, it becomes identical to a matrix model, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there must be, I would think, some way to interpolate. Um, between a local, you know, a, a, a space-time description, right? Mm -hmm. And then the matrix model description. Now I realize that, you know, the n equals infinity limit itself is, is, is subtle, but there's got to be some kind of relation, I would think, along that line. Does that make any sense to you? You know, I, 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 I yield the floor to my collaborator, Shumit, because I, I'm not as well versed in Eguchi Kawai. I mean, in general terms, I see what you're saying, but uh, Sh Shumit, you could probably give a more informed answer. <laughs> well, I, I think in a sense, which what you're saying is right, because you can think of Eguchi, the emergence of space in Eguchi Kawai as an expansion around uh, a kind of a classical solution. I mean, Right. You know, it's it's like the way, it's, so in that way, it's like the way, you know, uh, the membranes appear in the BFSS model. I mean, I'm talking right. about the twist, what people call the twisted Eguchi Kawai. Oh, yeah, sure. But, um, right. so, yeah, but I mean, one, yeah. one way to think about it is that, is as you go to large N, you can expand the Wilson loop uh, more and more by going around and around and around, right? So you, you can sort of see how the space time is opening up as n goes to infinity, right? In fact, I mean, you actually are doing the same calculation as if you were taking a lattice and expanding the lattice size and n. So there's gotta be a relationship between the space time structure yeah. So, Shumit mentioned the uh, twisted degree Kawai, but the, you know, that we use is a uh, 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 fuzzy torus. And, uh, you know, also in a BMN matrix model, you can use fuzzy sphere and you can add relay to matrix, some de matrix degrees of freedom to some uh, geomet geometric degrees of freedom. And uh, so I was, I wondered 
if you use a similar idea of color entanglement in color space, maybe you can just uh, get the geometric uh, yeah, well, entanglement in those there's uh, spaces. A, there's, a, there's a simpler kind of interpolation that um, uh, Nauenberg and, and Narayana do where they take um, a lattice that's larger, but it's, let me, I couldn't get this right. Uh, but it's not as large as the correlation length, right? So uh, there uh, is a, what know, they did. What they did was, uh, if you just do naive image kawaii, then uh, at least coupling center symmetry you get broken. But if you have a sufficiently large, but not too large lattice, you can keep a center symmetry completely. That's right. So, so what happens is that you you don't have enough space time to give you the entire distance of a large area of Wilson loop, right? <laughs> But nonetheless, you can still use the large end limit to go beyond the size of the lattice. So there is an interpolation there, which is some. Um, no, and some of the some of the lat supersymmetric lattice constructions, you can think of an orbit folding of uh, a matrix model. Yes. Where the specific, you know, the lattice structure is indeed coming from specific color structure. Right. Uh, now. I guess how unique that is, is another qu question. Um, but, um, but indeed, but you I, have, I, I mean, all you have to do, I, I would think, is to grow one extra dimension so you could get out of quantum mechanics to field theory, right? Yeah. No, right. Richard, Richard, what you are saying is not strictly correct. For that condition oh. to hold, large and becoming emergent geometry, you really need unbroken center symmetry, as yeah. Masanori emphasized. Otherwise, well, you do not produce you know, uh, emergent geometry. No, no, I, 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 you're absolutely right. You do, I, I understand that. But you can get unbroken center symmetry uh, in two different ways, by twisting, or you can let the lattice, the sub lattice go to keep yourself in the right phase. Hmm. There, there are two ways um, to do this. Yeah, of course. Uh, that's what we call deformation, yeah. To enforce that phase, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay, I'll, uh, enough. But I, I think it'd be interesting to know how one relates to the other. Yeah, yeah maybe no, I can no. I can make a um, somewhat no. related comment, perhaps, which please, is that, uh, uh, you know there is a relation between n number of uh, d zero brains and a single d two brain, in which the you know the coordinates along the d two brain are somewhat like the two legs of the matrix that describes the n number of d0 brains with the flux. And uh, yeah. so this is, this is one mm, sort of obvious, uh, you know, geometrization of this color space that Sandeep was talking about, uh, in which, uh, you know, this, this is something that we have also been thinking about, mm, but have not fleshed it out, but it's already there in the standard d brain literature, you know, uh -huh. the appearance of the d2 brain uh, as, an, as an effective a description of n number of these events. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, Gautam, it's also connected to what Masanori was saying and you have emphasized to, to me, right? For example, if you have a fuzzy sphere, uh, yes. right? That can right. be thought of as a D2 brain wrapping this surface. Indeed. Um, and right. then uh, that, uh, then it will be very interesting to ask whether the target space entanglement maps to geometric entanglement with some cutoff, right? Absolutely. It should happen, yeah. but so, uh, we... can I can I make a comment? Yeah. In fact, people have uh, people have uh, um, there's some literature about trying to come up with a notion of entanglement in non-commutative spaces using the underlying construction in terms of matrices, particularly for fuzzy spheres. Mm -hmm. uh, it is in morally uh, again you know an entanglement in the color space which appears as an entanglement in real space in such models but uh, it's a little bit different from what we are doing i mean i mean we can we can sort of talk about that and, and, and one of the one of the comments i would make is that if you look at that i mean you can say that okay i mean in order to define a region on this in, on this membrane, which you have made out of the matrices, I'll restrict to a set of certain angular momentum modes or, you know, like localize the thing like that. 
I found it very hard to get a really a, a sub algebra from that kind of thing. You always get some subspace of operators, but you know, you take enough of them and you go out of that algebra. But maybe that's good enough to understand this. I mean, it's not, it's not ruled out. I think. Yeah. But that's certainly an approach to understand um, uh, how to get spatial entanglement from underlying color degrees of freedom. Yeah. Well, what's the problem with a subalgebra? I guess I'm not quite. So it's a thing is that uh, if you take uh, products of, if, if you, at least in the constructions which people have followed, if you take uh, products of operators which uh, which you have kept, you will quickly go outside that, uh, you know, outside that subspace which you have defined. Uh -huh. Yeah. Some... I mean, we have been a little more uh, conservative in, in saying that we only want to work with subalgebras. You know, products of operators belong to the algebra itself. Yeah, but I think this connection between the fuzzy uh, sphere, say, and in, from both perspectives, this two brain and zero, I think it should teach us something. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I... So, uh, yeah, it's among the many things we should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, Actually, one question which is which came to my mind uh, is Toby still here? Toby, no, Toby's not here. Okay, I'll, I'll ask that later. Okay, actually, I'm sorry, I have to run to the men's room, so maybe <laughs> I'll take my leave if you don't mind. Since uh, maybe maybe in the meantime we can uh, let him go and uh, Costas can check if he can share the Excellent. screen and okay thank you very, very interesting talk as I woke up <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank, thank you, you so much yeah. <laughs> thanks thank you Masanori thank you Anush thank you everyone.